next week, uh, next week we have the opportunity to be able to give to the Great Commission Fund uh, that's part of the CNMA. Uh, I see laughter. What's going on with the laughter out there? Okay. <laughs> it's just my wife, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, next week we have the opportunity to give the Great Commission Fund. Um, it's an incredible opportunity for us um, as part of the Alliance community to be able to uh, focus on the Great Commission and what God has called us to. Um, as, I, as I think about the years that I've been uh, part of a Muncie Alliance, um, that's one of the things that uh, just is an overwhelming, gives me an overwhelming sense of, of hopefulness um, is the focus that I've seen uh, us have on uh, reaching out to the nations. Um, and I'm going to share probably in the message a little bit today about some of the things that, I, uh, that God drew me to uh, being a part of Muncie Alliance um, back quite a few years ago now uh, that really resonate uh, with, with this core of who God is as his people. And, uh, and so I, I'm just thankful to be able to, to have the opportunity to contribute together with you um, towards this, this need and uh, this call. So let's pray here as we begin the message. Lord Jesus, um, I, pray for, uh, I pray for clarity this morning. Um, not, uh, not clarity of my own heart and mind, not clarity of this church's hearts and minds, but, but a clarity that is a resounding, clear voice from you, Lord, uh, that is undeniable and that speaks uh, what you want to speak to us today. So God, as we uh, come to this passage in Luke chapter 13, I pray that you would um, bring it alive for us and that you would call us together around the message uh, that, that this uh, revelation of who you are um, is to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm used to uh, having a uh, little stool or something up here to set my coffee, so I'm going to borrow a music stand there. I got it. I got it. Ah, that's what people are laughing about. I'm in the dark. That's nothing new. <laughs> All right, we're in, the chap, uh, we're in Luke chapter 13, be beginning with verse 18. I'll probably be looking at a couple of, uh, I'll probably be reading through this a couple of times, once altogether, and then breaking it down a little bit, and uh, using uh, the ESV to start with, and I think the NIV to kind of go through. So those of you who are reading along, um, nothing like jumping from one translation uh, or paraphrase to the other. Thus Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? To what should I compare it? It is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the wild birds nested in its branches. Again, he said, to what should I compare the kingdom of God. It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until all the dough had risen. Then Jesus traveled throughout towns and villages, teaching and making his way toward Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? So he said to them, Exert every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, then you will stand outside and start to knock on the door and beg him, Lord, let us in. But he will answer you, I don't know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 
and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. Then people will come from east and west and from north and south and take their places at the banquet table in the kingdom of God. But indeed, some are some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. At that time, some Pharisees came up and said to Jesus, Get away from here, because Herod wants to kill you. But he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Look, I am casting out demons and performing healings today, and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will complete my work. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the next day because it is impossible that a prophet should be killed outside Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would have none of it. Look, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, You will not see me until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, This is a hard passage. Uh, Yeah, you see people laughing, yeah. (laughs) So you you want to preach? (laughs) It's got some, uh, it's loaded with lots of great theological struggles and questions. Uh, It's practically challenging. Um... It uh, honestly, I don't want to preach this morning. If you want to know the truth, I, I really don't. And it's not just because of the passage of scripture. Um, I struggle with this, this this scripture, and I'm going to be all over the place. Um, I probably won't have a lot of consistent things to say, but I am going to try to be faithful to speak what the truth of the scriptures bear to us here this morning. And so, I appreciate as I'm going that you would would pray that God would would use my words to be able to help you understand some of the text and that he would use my words to help me understand the text and that together we would would wrestle with what this passage has for us as Muncie Alliance Church and as individuals who are gathered here before the word today. Um, There's one word in this that really struck struck a chord in me. Um, And... uh, it's translated a couple of different ways, um, but uh, you can find that word in the section on the narrow door, and it's in verse 24. It says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. It's not a word that we speak very often uh, when it's related to our faith, because after all, we are saved by grace, and we are saved by grace. It's not by our own works, it's not by our righteousness, it's not by anything we do, but it's by what Christ has done. And yet, here it is in this text, it says, strive to enter through the narrow door. Literally, this word means to agonize. And I thought about this for a lot, and actually it just hit me kind of as I was sitting out there and we were singing here uh, this morning. It struck me that the word, a word that, that, that can really resonate, I think, with, with the spirit of what Jesus is saying here to all those listening to him and all of those he is challenging with the message of the kingdom. And the word that came to me was the ravished. Not, not just, have you ever been really, really hungry? And you're ravished, just like, oh, man, i got to have something to eat. Have you fallen in love with someone? you just got to be with them. And your heart is ravished. To the point of agony if you're not with them. The core, I think, of the message today is that Jesus wants a people with ravished hearts. He wants a people who are so in love and so passionately consumed with who he is 
they can't do anything else but get to him and be with him and fellowship with him and walk with him and talk with him and and just be in his presence. Nothing else will do. Ravished hearts. Um, I had six different beginnings even two minutes ago of my message. <laughs> um, and last night when I kind of said I'm done, I don't have anything else to figure out here because I can't figure anything else out. Um, I closed things down. I got up this morning and really felt the Lord said, okay, now all the things that you couldn't figure out, that you thought you figured out, drop them. I want you to tell why you are here at Muncie Alliance this morning. Um, so, um, I had a, a few minutes and I, I've written some journal entries over the years um, and I, I recalled a couple and I, I, so I went to my computer and I pulled one up and I'm going to read something that, that I wrote oh, a, a few years after we had been here not, not very long after we had come maybe one or two years after we had come here to be at Muncie Alliance I haven't shared this with my wife. I haven't shared this with anyone at all. It's just my own personal thoughts before the Lord. I'm a little bit embarrassed in some ways to even speak them to you this morning. Uh, But I really felt that the Lord wanted me to share a little bit of of why I'm here and and the struggle that I have in being here, if you want to know the truth. Um, I don't, don't, you know, I think we get this picture of, of the church uh, and people flying after God as if there's, you know, the, the best church to be in is where you're not struggling. I think that's the worst church to be in, if you want to know the truth. Because if you're not struggling, how can you have a ravished heart? Really. And, uh, you know, the, the best movies, the best stories that we, that we watch on television and that we, like, read and read to us are... Uh, filled with those who have agonizing hearts and long to to be together, right? And they fight to be together. And they fight to be able to, to share in the love that they have. And the love we have is because of Jesus Christ. And we need to be fighting and striving and agonizing and ravished in our desire to walk in that love with one another and with our Lord. And so, anyway, I'm going to share this, uh, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of stories that I recall um, in those, actually the the second time that I was together with anybody in Muncie Alliance. Uh, So, this right here is a few years after that second time I'm going to share this was on an ordinary day, 8405. I have no idea what was going on then. I don't even remember or recall what was happening that year. Um, but it was an ordinary day. I wrote, I cashed in my 401k and paid my bills, all in faith, so it seemed. Though if I must be honest, it was in part also desperation. A sanguine blend of blind faith, poker face risk, uneasy hope, and the mystical expectation for something extraordinary to happen with my life. Then I buckled down for the long haul of the life of a bivocational pastor. It would all work out. I could expect a few bumps, and even being ruffled up a little by the fiery darts of the enemy. I was David with the giant. I was the Israelite people at the Red Sea. After all, I saw the end of the story where I'm on the winning side. Never mind the heritage of those Solomon II, lambs devoured by the wolves. Those who went from the promise went for the promise, but in this life never tasted it. 
Their perspective on a city whose foundation and builder is God was vastly different than my idealized launch into ministry, where, by miraculous favor, or perhaps somehow by my sheer will, the heavens would open and the kingdom's power would usher in a new world order. Funny thing is, I've crashed and burned before. I won't bore you with the details. Yet somehow I knew it was going to be different this time. Yet here I am. My money is gone. My already burden of debt increased. My own ministry is mediocre at best. And God hasn't shown up yet in a pillar of fire by night and a cloud of, and a cloud by day. No doubt it is my personal sin that has prevented all this from happening. I've robbed God of this tithe. I've been anxious in all things. I've been living enslaved to debt, and my devotional life is going through the motions with no personal connection with my creator and friend. I know grace and mercy are mine. And I know God understands my need of these realities in my life, but I'm tired and find myself in another restless night. Dreading to sleep, knowing that tomorrow is another day of difficulty before me, the power of positive thinking, name it, claim it, faith, even the, the old way of Hudson Taylor and George Mueller and faith missions, these all haunt me and confuse my mind and heart. I'm a bad representative of the living Savior who has promised humanity an abundant life. Perhaps I'm attempting to be Mother Teresa without her humility, without her simple faith and trust, without the years of character training God built in her for, after years of preparation. I don't want the easy way out. I want the right way, the true path, and the clear word of God. You may walk, you, yet my walk is silent. This destruction of my finances and the wrecking of my family's security, what God wants, and that's what I was thinking at the time. I'm still here. Without a clear word from the Lord, and at this juncture, am I left to find my own means, a job not in ministry, that will get me back on a stable foundation? Elders, those who serve in the church, are supposed to be fine, upstanding providers for their home. I am not, and I feel as if I'm leading them to ruin. Emotionally, I don't think I can handle much more before I collapse on the floor and blubber uncontrollably like a baby until they take me away in a little white jacket and place me in the rubber room to keep me safe. God, you know at 18 I wrote a song of dedication to you. I still echo in my heart those words. Yet I know that I have also stayed straight at times. Don't forget the cries of my youth and don't turn away from my cry now. I need your direction, and I need a clear path set before me, not one of manipulation, not one of man's contrived and convoluted thinking, but a divine direction, spoken, breathed, and imparted from your heart and mind, audible as a dream or vision or as a prophecy, a blessing, a word of knowledge. I'm appealing to you right now for a life-altering word from you. Jesus, in your name I seal this prayer, confession, plea, by your spirit and under the protection, under your protection, healing, and, under the protection, healing, and salvation of your blood. Now to collapse in my bed for the new day, you have called me to walk humbly with you. In. I remember coming here uh, to Muncie Alliance. It was a Sunday morning. Uh, my wife and I had been attending Union Chapel for nearly uh, 14 years. Um, we were slotted to go on a uh, church planting team uh, to Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, met together with the pastor and the, the team that were getting ready to go, and, and for some reason, I don't even really clearly know even now today why, uh, things just kind of fell apart and it didn't make sense any longer for us to go and we wrestled over that and, and I remember saying to Randy Craney uh, the, one of the associate pastors in Union Chapel if you go uh, on this church plant and we don't go with you what am I to do? Because that's what we thought we were called to do and that's where we thought we were supposed to be and, and, and I said you know my heart for ministry, and, and if we don't go on this, I, I see it being years before I have the opportunity to step into any of that. Randy said to me, do you, go, do you guys know about Muncie Alliance Church? What? 
So do you know what they're doing there? And the, the church planting that they're both focusing on sending out and this coffee and ministry and business and, and launching out. Yeah, I think you guys would really resonate with what's happening there and what's going on. Now, this is a pastor of another church telling us about this, right? Now, we had lots of friends, lots of close relationships, and we liked it where we were. We were perfectly content and comfortable being there. We had no inclination to go or be anywhere else. So, my wife and I talked about it, and we just kind of put it aside. The next week, I think Eric and Tina Hadeen, we talked to them, and we didn't even know that they were attending Once the Alliance then. We'd known them for a number of years. And, you know, they said to us, I think you guys would really like it there. And then the, strike two, exactly. And then the next week, and the next week, and it seemed like every week after that for, I don't know how long was it, how long was it, hon? Four weeks? Four, oh, it happened four times? Yeah, four, four times within a couple of weeks. This, I think you guys would really be great at Muncie Alliance. I think you guys would really understand and, and resonate with what's happening there. And so finally, my wife and I went, well, we should visit. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> so we visited. Um, now, the, the day that we visited, was, was that the day of my birthday party? Or was it the next week? Okay. Okay, so we visited in September. That's right. We visited in September. I was like, man, we just like, this is an awesome place. You know, teeming with, you know, lots of young people. Um, it, you know, you come in, there wasn't room to sit down sometimes. Uh, and uh, the message from the word is really clear and it's just pretty amazing. Um, and so, anyway, fast forward a little bit to, to November. Uh, I don't even remember what year now. And uh, we, we came back. And, well, was it at that first meeting? So I, I should, didn't collaborate. And I told you I wasn't prepared for this morning. Um, did we, and my wife and I are having a dialogue with the rest of you around us. <laughs> yeah, my, I'm, I'm really bad with these details. My wife always remembers. Well, I don't know what's going to happen if, if, if something would happen to her. I would be lost. <clears throat> But anyway, uh, when did they announce the Ireland uh, meeting? That first week? Oh, yeah, the first week that we, uh, we came back, uh, uh, November 17th, and they said, ah, we, we said, this is supposed, we're supposed to be here. And so anyway, we, um, two quick cool details. I went to Greg Paris um, after we decided that we were going to be here, and I said, this is what we're doing. And he said, hey, You've been, we, we love you guys here. Uh, this is home uh, for you, so if you need to come back and raid the refrigerator uh, anytime, uh, we understand, but, uh, but if this is where God is calling you, remember uh, that uh, that will now be your new church home. And it's kind of like, kind of like, okay, son, out of the house. Um, we love you, uh, but we know that you, you're called to to, to do other things than just stay here. And so he blessed me and sent me out and our family out, and so we ended up here. To me, it's just amazing. It's about the kingdom, you know? And if we, if we forget that it's about the kingdom, we're all in trouble. <laughs> but anyway, I'm rambling. Um, we ended up here, uh, and they, they announced that that... that uh, there was going to be a meeting about Ireland uh, for those who wanted to go and send and launch a team out uh, to, to go there. So we showed up, and it was at uh, the Let's Place um, out uh, in the e e Eaton Way uh, that they had this meeting. There were about 30, 40 folks who showed up there, a lot of young folks. Um, and everyone is like, you know, this coffee thing, I just really believe that God, God's called me to be able to do a church plan in the coffee. And, and Ireland, wow, yeah. This is, this, 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 it's, it's amazing. And there were just so many young folks and so many older folks who were like, we're, we're going to do whatever God calls us to. We're going to do whatever God calls us to. 
and we're going to we're, we're, we're going to partner with the Lord and, and, and walk that out. And uh, I knew that it was right then after we made the decision that we were going to come and we went to that meeting that we go, we're in the right place. Now, why am I sharing all that? It's not just a story about me. What, why I'm sharing that is because I believe that one of the demarcations of Muncie Alliance Church are that we have have a history of being a people with ravished hearts. That's our heritage. The kind of hearts that Jesus was looking for here. We didn't have the knowledge. We didn't have the organization. We still don't. We didn't have a lot of things that were needed but there was resident in this church body a passion to serve the Lord. And it's still here. I think we've forgotten part of it. I think we have gotten bogged down by many things. Actually, I shared this. You know, many of you go, wow, you know, he really desires to serve the Lord. No, I didn't. I didn't really desire to serve the Lord. I didn't. I said it. I said I did. But if you listen to the underlying theme there, my underlying theme is, oh God, I'm poor. And it's still an underlying theme in my life. Oh God, I'm poor. If you don't do something... God, may I be poor that I had, that I may walk with a ravished heart. My friend Grant Butler back there understands this when I wrote Is destruction of my finances and the wrecking of my family security what God wants? No, I don't think it is. And yet we go through them. Without a clear word from the Lord, ministry means nothing. Grant knows that. Talk to him about it sometime. He'll tell you a story. I love Grant's call to ministry and what God has called him to. It's, it's his story to tell, so I'm not going to tell it. But talk to him about it. Sometimes we walk through some rough stuff in our following of the Lord. But it's good and it's right if we are in love with Him. All right, I'm, I knew I would ramble a lot today. Let's go back to the Word of God and let's break it apart here related to, to this one central theme that I'm looking at here. Luke 13, 18. He said, Therefore... said, therefore. I can find in my notes I broke that scripture down there twice. That's why I'm confused. Today's reading begins with these words, he said, therefore, which expresses a prior reason, motive, or cause. Luke is letting us know that these parables are giving insight on the subject of what he has just what, what has just happened? The crowd may be in high spirits with what they have witnessed. What they just witnessed in verses 10 through 17 was a daughter of Abraham whom Satan had bound for 18 years who was loosed from her bond on the Sabbath day. But do they understand the meaning of it? What they have witnessed is a sign of the coming kingdom. 
It is now at hand. The tree has reached maturity. The yeast leavened. The kingdom is upon them. Rejoicing is a good first step. But it must be followed by repentance and faith. So in the typical form, Jesus follows up the miracle that was performed of this woman being healed of her informity and released from the bonds of Satan. And he follows up the debate because there were those arguing against him healing on the Sabbath and doing this work. He follows them up with, by preaching the gospel message. Now the rulers of the synagogue and other adversaries, they didn't like what had happened. But the common folks did. And this is the story that happens just before these words he said, therefore. What is the kingdom of God like? What is the kingdom of God like? I'm going to pause for a second, and I'm going to divide the crowd up here in a few people for a second. The hearers that were hearing Jesus speak here and watching these miracles and the debate that was taking place had about four different kind of scenarios behind it that were happening in the people that were listening. Uh, first of all, there were the radicals. So you guys over here want to be the radicals? Okay. All right. Good, you're a radical. That's awesome. Well, the radicals were the zealots, and uh, can you can you kind of like quote a word for me? Can you go "Viva la Revolution"? Yeah, "Viva la Revolution." Their hope is that Israel's God is going to rule Israel and the whole world, and that Caesar or Herod or anyone else of that ilk is not. The term zealots had a specific claim by a certain faction of the Jewish war, but it also referred to the more general idea of opposing uh, the Roman rule and authority. They were those who would demonstrate their widespread resistance to Rome in many various ways. And one of the watchwords or the phrases that they would often be heard saying uh, or declaring was, there is no king but God. There is no king but God. Good, amen, yeah, right. You get it. It's, 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 it's a great word to speak of. Um, so when they would hear uh, of Caesar opposing, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm God kind of like, or Herod raising up, they would, they would say in response, there is no king but God. There is no king but God. And they were willing to fight and willing to do anything in their power to see that this kingdom that was theirs would come. So, viva la revolution. I'll repeat that one. Viva la revolution. Yeah, you guys are real zealots, I can tell. <clears throat> then there was another group, uh, the, the, the religious. You have the radicals. You got... Uh, you guys... Oh, and Cindy's going, over there, over there, over there. Okay, 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 we'll do over here. Yeah, she, 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 she convinced me. So over here on this side, there are the religious, all right? Sorry, folks. The religious, there were the Pharisees and the Essenes, two different groups. Now, some of you want to be the Pharisees. Most of you probably want to be the Essenes, because who are they, right? <laughs> well, the, the, the Pharisees, um, they would say something like, Come out and be ye separate, right? Can you guys kind of repeat that? Right. And then the Essenes, they, they would kind of say, they would kind of say, we hold the secret. Can you get uh, some of the, yeah, right, you guys say it again. We hold the secret. Right. There you go. The Pharisees awaited the anointed ones, a king and a priest who would lead the people of Israel in a victorious battle against the sons of darkness. Because, of course, the Pharisees were the sons of light, right? We are the sons of light, and everyone else are sons of darkness. 
Uh, and it's only understandable. They lived in a world where sacrifices were being made to foreign gods, where the culture was coming in, and it was just totally devastating who they were as a people. And the only way that they knew how to walk in that light was to come out and be separate, to represent the holy God in an unholy place, to fight for politically the, the, the laws and the rules and everything that would need to take place so that, what? The kingdom of God could be seen for what it was and that if they lived this way, that somehow God would come and defend them and make things right and set up his rule. And that's the kind of kingdom that they were looking for. Very similar to the zealots, but a different methodology and way of being able to do it. The Essenes, on the other hand, were a little different. They were a religious kind that went, we're going to go hide out in a cornfield somewhere uh, because we know that in the end, God is going to make everything all right. So we're going to go hide away. You probably, you, we have no parallels to any of this stuff today, right? No. No. <laughs> So they were going to go do that because they held the mystery. And they could hold on to that mystery until God came and proved that they were right. And that was the Essenes. Then there were the rulers, the priests, the the aristocrats, and the Sadducees. Uh, What would they say? What would have them saying? Uh, They would say, don't rock the boat. So, let's see, we'll, 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 those of you in the back, well, since those of you in the back like to rock the boat, uh, we'll, we'll get you out of character for a second, okay? Clear back in the back, can you just say, don't rock the boat? Don't rock the boat. Yeah, convincing. These folks, they believe that God's move is to restore creation through his people. Only those who had gone some way towards assimilation and who had therefore adopted a belief in the immortality of the non-physical soul, isn't that weird? The immortality of the non-physical soul could be God's agents. It was therefore imperative to deny any speculation about a future life for the social, for social political reasons. In other words, they didn't believe, didn't believe in the resurrection, not because it wasn't intellectually defensible, but if you believed in the, in the resurrection, you might be considered a revolutionary. And they were entrusted with the religious care of their Jewish community, and they didn't want to rock the boat because they needed to make sure that the temple and that Jerusalem and that everything that was a part of the Jewish system was preserved and not shaken up so that maybe someday God would do something that would, like gradually work its way through society and the Jews would be all okay again and their political authority and rule would be restored to what it needed to be. But, but they wanted to make sure if they had to compromise to do it, they wanted to. If they had to, 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 to not fully engage in a lot of things that, they, 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 that were just religious, they would do that. And it's not all the Sadducees or the aristocrats or the, the uh, priests were this way, but a large number of them were. Um, And this actually was one of the largest ruling uh, classes, the Jews. There were like some 20,000 of those folks. There were maybe 6,000 Pharisees and 4,000 Essenes. Um, Zealots were just kind of all over the place. I don't know what their numbers were. Um, So, that was them. And let's not forget the common folk. Now, Cindy... We'll put you uh, in, in this group here in the front in the middle. You could be part of the common folk. Is that all right? Okay. What, what are you going to say? As Jews, you would say, we are the people of God. Isn't that great? We are the people of God. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, kind of like the Munskins, right? They were the average Jew who saw the world through the storyline that was well known and retold daily of the one creator God, his people Israel, and the imminent deliverance and restoration that he was bringing for them as his people. 
they knew the stories, right? They knew who they were, and they just wanted to be who they were. They were looking, honestly, sometimes they would look at the zealots and go, well, resonates with our story. Yeah. Sometimes they would look at the Pharisees and they go, oh, they're fighting for our cause. Sometimes they would look at the Sadducees and go, oh, I need protection today. Oh, Sadducee, please be here. Right? They wanted to be okay. And these were the kinds of dialogues that were taking place when Jesus is speaking to them. And Jesus confronts all of them with the message of the kingdom of God. As he confronts us all who have these similar kinds of thoughts here today with the message of the kingdom of God that he confronts Muncie Alliance Church with related to the kingdom of God. And what is Jesus saying to all of them? All your strategies, all your ideas, all your thinking about your own view and means of seeing the kingdom of God come are wrong. You think you know what the kingdom of God is like, don't you? You don't. What is the kingdom of God like? And to whom and to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. And it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. That's an interesting image of the kingdom of God, isn't it? The, the, the translation, just, it's, not, it's not really that the, the, the mustard seed isn't what he's saying the kingdom of God is like. A lot of us read through that, and I've read through it thinking that was what it was. Really, kind of the words of the phrasing says, the kingdom of his God is like the one who sows a mustard seed, or it is like the act of sowing a mustard seed. So it was about the mustard seed, but it wasn't just about the mustard seed. It was about the very act and action of the mustard seed being sown. Uh, and the mustard seed, in, in that context, is kind of really interesting. It gets planted in a garden. That's not where you would typically plant a mustard seed. You might plant it among the fruit trees, because if you plant the mustard seed in the garden, it kind of slowly takes over, and it's like a weed and it destroys the rest of the garden because the birds come to it and they enter into it and they mess things up. Well, guess what Jesus is saying? The kingdom of God messes things up. All these ideas that they had about what the kingdom should be like, when Jesus sows the kingdom of God in the midst of his people, it messes things up. In the same way, kind of like the leaven. It's a little bit. It does its work. And what does it kind of do? It, it, it causes things to move and to grow. And they start small, but they become large because that is God's design for the kingdom to enter into his world. I don't know about you and I, but I'm like the zealot and lots of times. I want the kingdom of God come great big in powerful ways to be able to rescue me and take care of things for me. Other times, I'm like the Pharisee and I want the kingdom of God to justify why I'm living the way that I'm living because it's after all right and godly. And one day I will be vindicated. And you can go through the different scenarios that are here. But the kingdom of God messes things up. The kingdom of God turns out to be utterly unpredictable, uncontrollable, beyond human expectation. We plant mustard and get trees, and the trees act, attract all kinds of birds. That's a quote by David Rinsberger. 
a couple of scriptures that are interesting. Acts, in, in, in Acts, we see this uh, demonstrated in a clear way with the early church. Acts 17.5 says, They wanted to drag Paul and Silas out to, the mo- out to the mob, and so they went straight to Jason's home, where they thought they were. But when they did not find them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the Lord's followers. They took them to the city authorities and shouted, Paul and Silas have been upsetting things everywhere. Now they've come here. In Acts 16.20, her master's hope of wealth were now shattered. So this was a sorceress who comes to, to Christ. And so her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities of the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of the Jews, they shouted. These Jews who have come to follow Christ. So the kingdom of God does mess things up in our world. It messes it up in ways that, uh, that we really can't fully predict. And yet when we walk in what God calls us to and do the work and that he's called us to and bring uh, people into him, he begins to, to do work within us that takes its effect. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we see things getting messed up. Real quick comparison, though. Just a chapter earlier, Jesus had warned his followers about the yeast of the Pharisees. So in this battle of the kingdoms, we do have some choices to make. We can find ourselves like the yeast of the Pharisees who corrupts that which God is doing. Or we can find ourselves partnering with what God is doing and seeing that work shake things up. So we have a choice in whose kingdom we're going to be a part of. And that's really what this next section begins to talk about in the narrow door before I, before I read that, uh, I'm going to give an overview that Mark Driscoll gives here um, on that teaching um, from this passage of Scripture. I thought it summarized things very, very well about what we're going to, to take a, a quick look at here. Salvation is one narrow door, and that narrow door is Jesus. It's exclusive. There's one door. It's inclusive. All are welcome. The narrow door divides heaven and hell, and it is closing. There is no second chance for salvation after death. When you die, the door slams shut behind you, and you will stand before Jesus. He is the one who will judge you. Now he is weeping, inviting you to run by faith through the door that he has suffered, died, and risen to open for you. The decision is yours. This is a hard thing. The church doesn't like to speak on this passage of scripture, uh, and I rambled on avoiding speaking on this passage. No, I didn't do it for that reason, but uh, I don't know why I said that. Um, But it is. It's uncomfortable. And the question that the people of God ask when they begin to realize what the kingdom of God is, those who are following after Jesus, the question that we ask is, wow, if, if this is what the kingdom is like, who can be saved? And how many are going to be saved? Is it like they say that only few will be saved from this time? And Jesus does not really completely answer uh, this question um, immediately of whether it's going to be few or not. What does he do? He goes, don't worry about how many or how few. Worry about the opportunity and how long you're going to have the opportunity. I am here with you. I am walking with you. You have a choice before you. And so that's kind of what Jesus is calling out here. As Jesus goes about his mission, he is holding open the gate of the kingdom and urging people to enter it. The church 
Chish's mission is exactly the same. We are still holding open the door of the kingdom and urging people to enter it. The key to going through the door is still the same. What do you think of Christ? Our task as a church is to keep the door open for everyone. It is not our job to close that door on anyone. It is for us to decide who it is not for us to decide who is in or who is not. That's God's job. Matter of fact, it may even surprise us at the last day who is in and who has come through the open door. There will be more than we know. That's kind of what 1330 kind of is. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. The kingdom of God is right now an open door for us. And Jesus is saying, oh, Jesus is saying in the middle of this, and as we look at, uh, look at the Jews at the last part who, who reject Jesus as he's on his way to Jerusalem, we find an interesting thing that begins to happen. Jesus begins to really weep. And, and he has not, not just speaking words of judgment here and what's going to happen. He emotionally goes, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, what? I would that you would be gathered under my wings like a, like a hen. What does a hen do when it... Uh, when it senses danger. Let's say a fire is coming. And the hen knows a fire is coming. It's not uncommon to see that the hen will gather chicks underneath her wings. The fire comes, the hen dies, and the chicks are saved. Isn't that kind of what Jesus is saying? Look, I would that you would come to me. I am going to die for you that you might be saved, but you would not. Oh, that you would enter in the door when it's open. Oh, that you would come to me while there is time. Oh, that you would, your hearts would be ravished to be with me and to enter into what I have for you because my heart is ravished for you. This is what I desire, that as I give myself for you, as my heart is ravished for you, that you enter into and understand that ravished heart I have for you and your hearts would in turn be ravished for mine and we would be together. That's what this whole scripture is about. And the only ones who are in the kingdom of God are those whose hearts are ravished because they recognize and understand that the love of Christ is compelling and calls us and invites us into that kingdom. (coughs) Why did I go into the personal story related to all this and why I'm at Muncie Alliance Church? Because I just, I've been impacted by a people whose hearts have been ravished. And I don't want us to forget that. I don't want us to become like the Jews here in Jerusalem. I don't want us to get caught up in being zealots. I don't want us to get caught up in being Pharisees. I don't want us to caught up in being thrown about by the whims of all the voices out there as the common folks. I want us to be about the true and authentic kingdom of God in which we have understand that the love of Christ, his ravished heart, is, is for us. And that we need to have our hearts ravished for him. Beautiful, beautiful picture. I'm going to conclude with a story here of uh, one of my favorite Danish philosophers. Um, now, I'm not talking about Lars Christensen, who many of us know. He's one of my favorite Danes, uh, he and his family. But I'm talking about a guy named Soren Kierkegaard. I, I know I pronounced that wrong. Sorry, Lars. 
But he tells the story of a small town that had a wonderful fire chief. He was a gentleman among gentlemen. Children loved to visit the firehouse. He always tipped his hat to the women, and he could always be counted on for good conversation with the men about town. Everyone liked the fireman because he was a nice guy. He made it a habit to be gentle and kind, which was unusual for firemen who was supposed to be tough. There was a fire one day, and the fireman charged the scene of the fire with his fellow firemen and heavy equipment. As they came toward the fire, much to their surprise, they encountered between themselves and the flames about 200 townspeople. And each of them was standing there with a water pistol aiming at the fire, going, squirt, 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 squirt. The fireman asked, What's going on here? A spokesman from the group turned and said, Well, we appreciate this wonderful work you are doing in our community, and each of us has come to contribute in some small way to your work. Squirt, 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 squirt. The fireman said, I don't get it. You're all crazy. Oh, we realized that we all could do more, couldn't we, folks? Said the spokesman. Almost definitely, everyone said. But we just wanted to offer this token of our support. Squirt, 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 squirt. You don't know what you're doing, shouted the fireman. True, but you have to appreciate the fact that everyone is willing to offer whatever help they can, said the spokesman. And everyone said, Amen, and went squirt, squirt. Squirt, squirt. At that, the firemen shouted, Get out of here! This is no picnic! There's a fire in! Fire doesn't require well-meaning people who come to make small contributions. A fire is a place where people come to give their lives. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is like this fireman, and he has announced... The kingdom is here and has given a declaration for the people to give their lives fully to this kingdom, to put down their squirt guns and get serious about the coming fire. This is the call to discipleship. It is a fireman's commitment. Lives are at stake, and Jesus is leading the way to lay down his life so that those perishing can be saved, and he has invited us into that kingdom, those with ravished hearts, those with a fireman's calling. And that is who we are. That is our legacy. That is what we are invited into this morning. Here we come. And uh, lead us in a song of worship. We're going to sing this last song about God's amazing and humble love that he would be ravished with love for us. Um, Would you consider your response? Consider your current state and your response. Would you stand with us?
down again. Jesus today. The altar is here available for you to come and pray because the door is open. Today is the day of salvation. If you have been following after Jesus but you've been distracted by all the other things about the kingdom of God and your heart is not ravished for him the altar is open for you. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would bring us to yourself and that we may be with you and that we may enter into the work that you are doing because it's the only work worth doing. And so Lord God, may we be blessed to enter into the narrow door. And may we grab a hold of a kingdom that cannot be shaken as we walk with you and talk with you in Jesus' name.